All right, all right, all right, all right, all right. Welcome back from lunch. Thank you for uh, watching our entertaining light show where we flicker between blue screen and other color screens. I hope nobody is, uh, um, you know, has any epilepsy or other sort of similar conditions uh, that might be affected. Uh, we are doing our best, I swear, but we are software people. We are not hardware people, so this does not come naturally to me. All right, couple of uh, announcements. Uh, number one, um, welcome back. I hope you had great lunch. I did. I'm all full right now. Try to stay awake. Um, number two, um, there are still a few spots open for the go for after party. So if you go to the conference website and you go to the schedule, there's a link on, on this evening slot for the after party. There's not many slots left. And also, if you don't go to the after party, you should go to the go for uh, booth just by the door and get one of these delicious kombuchas. These are incredible. Um, you know, and they did not pay me to say this, by the way. I'm just saying this as a, as a, as a personal note. All right, well, without further ado, we're going to go to our next session. So um, uh, before I start, there's a couple of QR codes here on the wall. Uh, so in most talk, um, you know, he'll be showing some sort of interactive demos that you can, um, you can use on your phone. Uh, these links will take you to the Expo app. So this is a like, general Expo player app that you can install on your Android or iPhone. So please do get it if you want to follow along. Um, the other reminder is that we will have the Q&A at the end of the session. Uh, we will do it here again at this beautiful desk. And you can ask questions to that at any point during the talks by going to Slido, so that's sli.do, and using the code FF2023. Uh, we would put his here on the screen, but we don't have the technology to actually do that. So you'll just have to, uh, you'll have, you'll have to listen to that. Um, all right, so Slido, slido, sli.do, as we say in, in Finnish. Um, and uh, code FF2023. All right, that's enough for me. Uh, I will now invite to stage uh, Mo Kazali. He's the head of mobile at BAM, which is a Theodore company. And he's be, he'll, he'll tell us all about the things that he's talking about. <laughs> there wow. we go. Creating universal design systems with utility first, utility first uh, styling. Everyone give it up for Mo. Thank you all for joining us. I know that that was honestly such a lovely lunch, so I'm surprised that there's so many people still here. It was very filling. Um, I have the very difficult task of trying to keep you all awake, so we'll see how well I do. All right, so I want to start with this. Show of hands, who's seen these clips on YouTube, Instagram, TikTok? OK, good number, OK. They, they kind of like do some perfect cuts, or they like do some very aesthetically pleasing things, uh, and then they're clickbaitily titled the most satisfying video on the internet. I was on Twitter the other day, and I got a very odd suggestion that prompted me to click. It was a collection of the most unsatisfying videos <laughs> on the internet. <laughs> it's terrifying. <laughs> like, who does that to a cake? Um, or like M&Ms and Skittles, mixing them together. Which is which, right? Uh, and it got me thinking, what is so unsatisfying, so infuriating, and just so annoying about this? Just watch this one. Ah, <laughs> there we go. So I thought about it, and, and really, it came down to the inconsistency of it. Um, as humans, we like consistency. Uh, we like to see patterns that we're familiar with. We like to see colors that match. Uh, and it's the same on apps, whether they be mobile or web. Uh, I don't know about you, but I can just feel it when there's just a couple pixels off with the padding, right? So this is a real problem. And the best teams out there still struggle to get this right. And the reason is it's a scalability issue. As projects continue to grow, inconsistencies creep up. It's only natural. Here's proof, all right? So GitHub has got, if you go through their style sheets, they've got hundreds of different text colors. Uh, Stripe does as well. There's dozens of different font sizes. And so the question then arises is, how do we tackle these inconsistencies? And when we're talking about universal design systems, how do we do it across web and mobile at the same time so that your apps look and feel the same regardless of the platform? Uh, and where does utility-first styling fit into this? I think the takeaway from this talk should hopefully be what can you share across web and mobile and what should you not share and try to keep separated? So let's jump into it. 
Before we get started, what are universal apps? Just a quick sort of linguistical reminder here. They're apps that run across web and mobile. Uh, the difference and maybe the subtlety that differs it from cross-platform applications is that universal apps try to respect the native implementations on the platform. So they try to mimic some of the native behaviors on iOS, Android, and web. Cool. So what are design systems, since we're in the design systems track? Let's get a quick intro. So design systems are a set of guidelines, principles, and assets that guide the design and the development team on the development of an application. So important things to note here is that these are both tangible and intangible things. They can be things like brand guidelines, how they feel, but they can also be more tangible things like spacing, coloring, uh, typography, what have you. And we're going to talk about that in a bit. Uh, it's also integral to mention that this is both a design thing and a development thing. It's not just something that's part of the design process. It's a development process as well. And it's kind of the contract between the design team and the development team. So uh, it's important to know that, because then it means both parties are involved. And the ultimate goal here is to get consistency and cohesiveness across the board. You want your apps to feel the same. You don't want users to feel like they're using two separate applications. And so there's a whole bunch of different things that fall into design systems. I'm going to be focusing on these three specifically. And I've kind of structured it like this, so they all kind of fit within a triangle. Starting from the top, there's design tokens that are the smallest elements in a design system. They then build up to UI components and finally into layouts. And we'll look and see what is actually shareable and what can you probably not share. Start off with design tokens. So design tokens are design primitives. Uh, and you can kind of think of them as the, a key value pair. So if it's like a dictionary, it defines terms that can map to specific design values. So these can be colors. They can be typography, or it can be stuff like spacing and breakpoints. So let's construct a very, very basic design system together. We start off, we have mappings for color primary as a term to this specific shade of blue, right? You no longer have to say, just make it blue. It's, there's a very specific term that you've highlighted as a contract between you and your design teams for it. You've got color secondary, which points to that purple. And then you've got font small as a design token that's mapping to 12 pixels as a value for spacing or for size. One of the nice things about design tokens is that you can actually alias things. So you can say, I want font subtitle to actually point to the value of font small. And this becomes really useful when you suddenly want to change styling across your app. So let's say Thais has actually uh, defined this subtitle to be 12 pixels, but she comes to me the other day and says, hmm, it's too small. We're getting feedback and saying, OK, this is actually not very visible and legible. What we can basically do is define a font medium, and then we can re-alias font subtitle and point it to font medium and effectively change all of the sizing across the board on all of our applications across all of the platforms without needing to ever modify what font small is. Now, imagine if you had to go in and actually do some sort of shotgun surgery to pull out where everywhere is pointing to 12 pixels or to font small and then find the ones that are subtitles. It's just a hassle. And this becomes massive for consistency. It gives you the power to architect your styling in a way where it becomes refactorable and you can change the branding as your business evolves and grows. Now, some of you will be familiar with utility first styling. Show of hands, who, is, who are developers here? A lot, OK. Um, so yeah, the idea, you, you will have seen utility first styling if you're a front-end developer. Uh, with utility first styling, the idea is that you define CSS classes that are reusable. And they are kind of the most common pieces of CSS that you find within your code, and they're very small chunks. So that's stuff like margin right small, which points to a margin of seven pixels on the right-hand side. It can be stuff like text size medium, which is setting the text size to two rem, or it can be a full rounded class, which gives you 100% border radius. You've seen this already, right? These are actually design tokens, right? We've been using these subliminally kind of as part of our development workflow if you've ever been using utility first styling. And the most popular implementation of utility first styling is, of course, Tailwind. Tailwind has caused countless holy wars in the community of developers. So it's a contentious topic, but it fits very well into this paradigm of consistent design across different platforms, uh, especially when you're dealing with component-based UI frameworks like React. Uh, it, it, it actually fits very well, and we'll take a look at why. So 
here's an example of a button. This is just a very simple Tailwind button. If you look at the classes at the top, rounded medium, background indigo 600, or P, which is padding of 2.5, these are almost pointing to contractual values that you have and you've defined as part of your Tailwind. Even the hover styles, when you start to click on a button, or when you hover over a button and it goes into the hover state, that is still not defined as some arbitrary value. It's not some arbitrary hexadecimal value. It's an actual design system value, which is the background of Indigo 500. So now for those of you who've used Tailwind, you'll know that there is a Tailwind config file. And you can adjust the theme inside of the Tailwind config. Does this look familiar? It is. It's a key value store that defines tokens to the values. So very much here, we, we've got a design token system. A lesser known feature here is that you can actually alias values within a Tailwind config to point at already existing values in your theme. So you've already got the aliasing mechanism in place, and everything is there for you to be able to use design tokens within your app. Now, in the spirit of consistency, wouldn't it be cool if we could have a single source of truth for our design tokens coming directly from the design team in Figma that would automatically sync to your code base and then push out to builds in your platforms on web, iOS, and Android. So we can do that. We're going to try to construct the basic, basic form of that and see how that looks. So there's a few sort of tech stuff that I'm going to introduce. There's a few like different tools that we're going to add, and uh, we're going to see how it works all together. The first is a Figma plugin called Token Studio. So Token Studio allows you to define uh, tokens on Figma. Uh, one of the things that it does is it can actually sync with GitHub and with other sort of uh, integrations. So what that effectively means is once you make changes, once your designers come in and make some changes on Figma, they can just push those changes to your GitHub repo directly without needing you to go in and manually change styles. Cool. The next step is to find some sort of unified language in terms of representing styling. Now, Amazon has created Style Dictionary. Style Dictionary is effectively just a JSON representation of styling primitives. And then lastly, we want to target Tailwind. Now, the reason that we have Style Dictionary in the middle is sometimes you don't want to use Tailwind. Sometimes you want to actually just maybe make native applications. This is agnostic to any platform that you want to build. You can effectively target the styling engines for Flutter if you wanted to. You can target the styling engines for native iOS and Android development. Uh, that style dictionary gives you the, the ability to basically target any platform that you want. Um, but we are going to use Tailwind for, this, for the sake of this exercise. Uh, and effectively, this can create an entire CI CD pipeline. So you're creating a CI pipeline in which you take something from Figma and automatically integrate it into your code and change the styling of your app. And I'm going to try to live demo it. So let's see how badly this goes. All right, we have a button. It's very simple. Now, this is a rather not a good button, right, Tice? OK, cool. Let's go and change that a little bit. So I've got Token Studio set up on Figma here. Um, this is kind of what it looks like. I've got an empty Figma project, but you can go in and change any values as you want. So I've defined a set of primitives here. I've called brown to match that specific shade of brown, red to match that red, and so on and so forth. These are already synced with my Tailwind config. These colors are the same here. So let's go and make a change on Figma. So if we look at our code for a second, and I'm going to open up the app uh, component here. Uh, what we have is we have uh, the view that's surrounding the button uh, set to background secondary, so it's pointing to our secondary color, and then the text itself that says I'm a button being our primary color. So those are awful primary and secondary colors. Let's change them up a little bit. Um, so let's see what our primary is set to. We're going to edit the token here. Now, primary is actually aliasing whatever the value of brown is. So if I were to change brown right now, it would actually change primary as well. But I actually just want to completely change that. Now, we are in future front end. We're in Helsinki. And I've enjoyed Finland immensely in the last few days. So I want to make this a bit more Finnish. So I've gone and searched the uh, Finnish flag color codes. And we're going to make our button a bit more Finnish. So what we're going to do is we are going to change our primary color to, well, let's change our primary color actually to white. So don't ever do that. And then we're going to change our secondary color to be the shade of blue that is on the finish flag. Cool. And while we're there, I don't really like this gray. So what we're going to do is we're going to change this gray and make it a bit lighter so that it just doesn't feel so jarring in contrast to the button. 
let's go ahead and do that. And so I'm happy I've made these changes. They're already saved to Figma. What I can do as a designer, if I was Tice, I can just uh, sync to Figma. So I can push to GitHub. Somebody scream a commit message, please. Initial comment. Initial comment. <laughs> I have about 20, so that's a lie. But OK, we're going to push this. now. You have the mechanism to define a branch if you wanted to, but um, we're just going to push to main because that's what you do in production apps. Um, and it's pushing to GitHub. Please don't fail. Yes. OK. So it's pushed to GitHub. All right. So now going back to my code, this would normally be in a CI CD pipeline, but what I've done is I've basically created a script uh, in Node that will pull from Git. Uh, it will then do the transformation to style dictionary, which is our common JSON representation. And then afterwards, what it's going to do is it's going to transform that into the Tailwind config. So let's see how it updates our Tailwind config. And I'm going to open the Tailwind config on this site so you can see. So the value for gray right now is 5f, 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 and primary is this. So let's run the script. I really need an SSH agent for that. All right, we're going to merge the branches. Cool. So you can see the Tailwind config has just gone and updated right there. Right? Our gray is now updated to modify to whatever the Figma values were. So is the secondary and the primary color. And now if I actually restart my servers on web and on iOS, we're going to restart and clear the cache. Let's start with iOS, and then we're going to start with web. So it's going to take a second to build. Has it? Let's see if this. Cool. Ah, classic. Okay. Second try. And then we are going to open up iOS as well. All right. So you can see on the web, we've rebuilt. And actually, our button is matching the finished color. So it looks a bit more pleasant now. On the mobile app as well, we've built. And it's pretty much synced now. The styles look the same. These are, by the way, these are native mobile apps. So this is an actual iOS app that behaves like you would expect it. And this is an actual web button. Cool. So it's the first demo. So we've defined our design tokens, which is the very primitive value. As you've seen, it's pretty much shareable across the board. Like, you can share all of it. There's common representations that are platform and language agnostic, so it works. Now let's go into UI components. So we take those design primitives, and we put them inside of our UI components. Part of a design uh, system is that we can define a library of UI components that match our branding and match our feel and kind of are consistent across the board. So this can be from very small things like the logo, the button, text, icons. It can get to bigger things like a drop down, maybe post headers or post tags, whatever you have if it's social media. And then the post and the app header is sort of like the biggest components that you can have here. Now, I've kind of put a hierarchy to this. It's called atomic design. This is like a known thing when making design systems. Um, but some people don't like this. But just to show that you can kind of hierarchically take from the design tokens, then build up to the atoms, then build up to the molecules, and then build up to the organisms. And you kind of have a very clear hierarchy of defined components there. Now, these are just UI components. But what happens when you're looking at universal UI components? So the, the, the rule and, and the idea behind universal UI components is that you want consistent look and feel across web and mobile. But at the same time, you want to respect platform-specific UX, which is kind of a contradiction, right? So when you're respecting platform-specific UX, you have to drop into the native implementations to achieve this. It's kind of a paradox, and it's sort of like these two forces that always play against each other with universal UI. It's kind of like a yin and yang effect. Um, you want things to look the same, but you want them to feel native and specific and different for the platforms. It's a bit weird, so let's look at that in practice. I'm going to convert this yin and yang symbol to a button. So on web, uh, the sort of desired effect, what you would expect to happen, is that if you hover over the button, It'll get lighter, and you have like a hover state there. On mobile, however, you, might, you don't have a hover state. If you have a hover state, sometimes actually if you implement it wrong, it could be detrimental and would trigger on tap. So you don't want that. So we just want an on-press state for that. So when the user goes and presses on the button, we want to actually make the opacity darker. 
That's the approach that we would take on iOS. That's the native implementation. So how do you get these two things that are almost the opposite of each other working on the different platforms when you have one UI library? It's a bit odd. Maybe your design team comes and says, actually, on iOS, we want the button to just rotate uncontrollably uh, when the user presses on it. So you've got to like, be able to have that flexibility to be platform specific. A lot of modern frameworks will actually allow you to create platform specific extensions. So you define a common component, and then you can extend and add a bit of extra functionality for Android, for iOS, and for web, if you so desire. Right? What will live in the component level is the base styles. You'll put all of the business logic there. You'll put some of the common APIs there. And then you'll have platform-specific implementations and extensions living in each of those files that mention if it's iOS or Android or web. The approach that this has, it means that you have one common API. Once you are using your design system uh, UI components, you have one common API that you can use. And it works on web, iOS, and Android. And they have different platform-specific implementations. So they look, behave, and feel different across the board. And we'll see what that means in a second. A really good example is this library called Zigo. So Zigo allows you to target uh, dropdowns across platforms, and it does native implementations across the board. So if you look at web there, what Zigo basically does is it delegates it down to Radix UI. So it's basically a headless dropdown that you can use on web, and it, it, and it sort of corresponds to all web standards, and it behaves as you would expect it to do on web. On the iOS side, though, what it does is it drops the native implementation and basically renders that context menu in Swift. From a developer perspective, what you effectively have is you are just creating a component in one language, and that's it. And it does all of this for you. This is what it means when we have platform-specific implementations under the hood. So let's look at an actual example of this. Let's say you have a button, and we're going to do this in React Native. Um, base styles, business logic, and common API is all living and shared across the board. But on Android, what we want to do for interactivity is we want to add a ripple effect whenever you click on it. So you press down, you get the material UI native uh, interaction and the feel. On iOS, what we want is we want to lower the opacity, and we want to give you a bit of a haptic feedback, so you have a little bit of a vibration on your phone uh, when you press down on the button. And on web, what we want is a hover and a focus state. These are respecting how you would interact with these on the platform specifically. And as if live demos aren't bad enough, we're going to make this one interactive. So uh, has anyone been able to download the Expo or Expo Go app? That's more than I was expecting. Amazing. Let's crash this network. Great. OK. Again, we're doing buttons because it's just simpler to talk about here. Um, I've created a future front end button. So you've got the logo inside of it. Now, this is the web implementation of it. Um, basically, I hover over the button, and the opacity gets a bit lighter. I don't know if you can see that. And then when I press in, the opacity gets even lighter. And so you can feel both a hover and a focus state. Cool? Now, I'll go through the folder structure a little bit. Um, I've got an app.js file here. And as you can see up there, it's basically rendering one component within it. It's called asset example. It's not a great name, but let's leave that. So it's just rendering a single component there, right? But what I've actually got here inside my components folder is I've got four different files. I've got an Android file. I've got a common file, an iOS file, and a .js file, which is just running the web implementation. So let's see what lives in common. So if we go from here, the two main things that are being exported from comment are a function, which is kind of business logic there, saying alert the user. So it's going to open up an alert that says, welcome to feature front end and try some Finnish Swedish, what? Finnish Swedish soup. That's awful. Try some Finnish salmon soup. There we go. That's better. OK. And it's also exporting some styles. Uh, I am so sorry if I just offended some Finnish people there. Um, we're exporting some styles that are going to be used across the board. Cool? Um, now, what we do is we import this inside of our JS file, which is for web. Now, the web implementation is handling like hover styles as well, um, and it's also uh, extending some of the styles for the, for the focus effect. Um, on iOS, what we do is we use a different pressable, and we also uh, call the haptics. So we call haptics to send a vibration to the phone and actually make it feel like you've pressed something. And then we call alert the user, uh, which is the function that we exported before. And then on Android, we've actually configured an Android ripple. So this is the ripple effect from Material UI. And we also have an on-press, again, alerting the user. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to press on the button here on web. And you can see you've got an alert there. That is a default implementation of an alert coming from the browser. right? Now, if you can scan this QR code, for those of you who have Expo Go, Uh, 
Ah, devices. 16, 17, 18, 20. Nice. Yeah. Someone from the expo team is going to send me a message tomorrow. <laughs> All right. Has everyone, has, have people gotten something on their phone? Nice? OK, cool. So you can see, first of all, on the phone implementation, I've actually added some text underneath the button. So you see I've been able to modify what is actually being rendered anyway on the platforms. But if you go ahead and press on it, on iOS, you'll probably feel a haptic. On Android, what you'll do is you'll have the, 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 effect of, the ripple effect effectively coming on uh, from material design. And the alerts that you're getting are specific to the platforms. So I'm getting an iOS alert. I presume the Android people are getting the Android native alerts. Again, the implementations are platform specific. They look and feel and behave as you would expect it on your phone. So you're not feeling like you've been alienated. You're not feeling like you're using a web app on your phone. You don't have a mobile app that feels like a website, or a website that feels like a mobile app, for that matter. And this is the power of this. We have one common set of styles, but effectively we extend them as and when we need them. Cool. All right, so we've looked at UI components. Some of it is shareable, not all of it is. Lastly, we're going to look at layouts. And this is where universal apps, in theory, stop being shared to a large degree. So this is where you start to have to think about platform specifically, and you need to implement the layouts in a platform specific way. So we'll look at an example for this. Uh, very basic. Twitter actually uses universal UI components. So they have a design system library that works on web, iOS, and Android, and it's the same UI component library. Now, if you look at the layout here, we've got a two-column layout. There's a primary column that has the feed, uh, and then there's a secondary column that's got a search bar and whatever is trending plus who to follow, right? If you go to the mobile app, what we have is that these are actually separated from each other into two different tabs within the ac actual application. So the layout is just fundamentally different. Like One is going to live all in one page. The navigation is going to be different. And so the approach that Twitter's taken here is saying, look, the layouts for these platforms and the way that you handle navigation and routing on these platforms is just fundamentally different. Why try to share them? Why try to abstract? Why try to move away from that UX that people are familiar to? So when it comes to layouts, it's very difficult to share them in a way where you don't intrude on the way that people expect apps to behave, and you don't intrude on the way that websites start, uh, people expect websites to behave. Cool. So we finish off with our pyramid of design systems. Starting from the top, we saw that design tokens are highly shareable. They're a unified language. It's platform agnostic. It's tech agnostic. You can essentially share them across the board with the right tooling in place. And we showed an example of a CI CD tool that does that. For UI components, we showed that there are frameworks that give you the possibility to build common pieces that you can then assemble and make them platform specific. And you saw the demo on uh, your app and on your phone to see how it respects the way that iOS and Android should feel. And then we saw with layouts that things shouldn't be shared where they naturally don't fit. And we saw that layouting is just fundamentally different on web and mobile because of the navigational differences. Uh, and so this is how we've constructed it. So starting from the top, there's the most shareable, and the bottom, there's the least shareable. And taking this pragmatic approach when you are building universal apps will make, it that, will make your development life cycle so much simpler. It'll make it pleasant, and it'll make the experience, uh, hopefully, a lot more enjoyable. Thank you all for listening. Uh, if you want to stay in contact with me, that is my Twitter, that's my LinkedIn. Uh, and yeah, thank you very much for your time. Mm -hmm.